one of America's most famous poets finally has her day. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things Dickinson got right and wrong. For this list, we're looking at the things Apple TV Plus got right and wrong in their show about famed American poet Emily Dickinson. This is not how he described it in the book. Yeah, it's way more fun than I expected. Number 10, The Woman in White, right. Can't we just get a maid? Over my dead body. We own six horses, Mom. I think we can get a maid. The show's first episode pays tribute to Emily's later life by dressing her entirely in white for its duration. While, like in the show, she wore a range of different colors in her formative years, by the late 1860s, she became known locally as the woman in white. Emily, what's wrong? I'm just scared. By some accounts, she was completely obsessed with the color, and after becoming a shut-in, the few times she was seen outside, she was dressed in white. In fact, the only piece of clothing we have of Emily's today is a white cotton dress. No one knows why she did this, with some connecting it with grief over her father's death, and others making different theories, but it's true nonetheless. Oh yeah, I'm a real catch. Number 9. Unconventional Poetry, Right. Despite writing roughly 1,800 poems, almost none of them saw publication during her lifetime, and the few that did were anonymous. Which is why I want you to enter it, my poem under your name. Me? I can't do that, Em. Why not? Well, for one thing, it's dishonest. Only half dishonest, the Dickinson part will be true. When they finally began to be published, they were heavily edited to fit into the conventional poetic standards of the time. Because I could not stop. Some of her most famous poems had verses changed, or even entire stanzas omitted. This was because of her unconventional style, like her extensive use of dashes and lack of titles. And this unconventionality is shown in the show every time we see and hear snippets of Emily's poems as she composes them. Wild nights, wild nights, where I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury. Number 8. Ben Newton. Wrong. Need some help? Who are you? My name's Ben. Where did you come from? Worcester. The young attorney was a real person who did come and work for Emily's father for two years in Amherst, and was even referred to by Emily as her mentor. But unlike the show, the two of them likely never fell in love or had any kind of romantic relationship, despite him being an important influence on her and a supporter of her poetic endeavors. You know, sometimes I want to ask you, you want to ask me what? To marry me. In real life, too, he died from tuberculosis, but this didn't happen while under Emily's care at the Dickinson homestead. He instead got married in 1851 and died far away. Emily didn't even find out about it until a few days after it happened. I only wish I could live to see it. <laughs> Don't say that. You're not, you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. You're going to be okay, Ben. Number 7. Cigarettes. Wrong. Never say never, Emily. In the very first episode, we see Emily share a cigarette with her friend and wannabe suitor George after she again gets into an argument with her mother. But this is very unlikely to have happened at the time of the 1850s. While people smoked tobacco for centuries, with the practice dating back over a thousand years to South America, mass-produced cigarettes didn't become popular until 1881. Want a drag? Fine. Before this, smoking cigarettes was possible, but didn't become widespread or common until the 1900s, long after Emily Dickinson's death. So while technically plausible that George could have an early cigarette, the likelihood of any of the characters smoking is very slim. You say that now, but little by little you would. Number 6. Cross-dressing. Wrong. How do I look? Handsome. The second episode follows Emily's desire to attend a lecture on volcanoes at the university, a lecture she is expressly forbidden from attending because she's a girl. She and Sue have the bright idea to dress up in men's clothes and sneak into the lecture anyway, with a helping hand from George, only to be caught and kicked out. Emily Dickinson? No, no. Uh, okay. Then who are you, young man? Uh, I am. Lysander Periwinkle. As funny as these scenes are, and as important as the fight for women's right to education still is today, this unfortunately never happened. 
Emily Dickinson did not cross-dress and sneak into college lectures, though she did learn about volcanoes by legitimately attending Amherst Academy. You never know when a volcano will erupt. Number 5. Abolitionism. Right. Hey, I know what play we should read today. Othello. Why don't you ever want to read Hamlet? Oh, come on, Othello is so much juicier. Oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. When the Amherst Shakespeare Club decides to read Othello at Emily's insistence, it serves as an enlightening look at contemporary America. Yes, Jane, Othello, he's black. I disagree. What? You can't disagree, it's a fact. Here, Emily is vocally anti-slavery, as is her brother, and she repeatedly implores her father to try to advocate for abolitionism as the Civil War looms. This is most likely true to life. We don't have much direct evidence, but what we do have suggests that Emily was very familiar with the abolitionist movement and she was close friends with local abolitionists like Thomas Higginson. And it's also true that Othello was one of her favorite Shakespeare plays and characters. Forget about the piano. We need you to act. I told you I can't. You can. Number four, her personality. Right. You are such a weirdo. Why am I so attracted to you? The show is modernized in a variety of ways, especially the music and the dialogue, which is all done to show the audience just how fresh and forward-thinking the real Emily Dickinson was. While it could have gone the way of a very serious portrayal of New England at the time, Dickinson scholars have expressed their support for Elena Smith's creation. It's a dangerous world and I'm trying to take care of you. I don't need you to take care of me. They're glad that Emily's reputation as the cat lady of American poetry is being challenged, with a brighter interpretation of the poet replacing the idea that she was a puritanical recluse. So much for living a life of solitude. Number three, Edward Dickinson, right. You can't print my name. Why not? Because my father doesn't approve of women publishing. Oh, come on. That's stupid. You're a genius, Emily. He has to approve of that. The strange relationship Emily has with her father Edward on screen is very similar to what we know of them in real life. Edward both disapproved of her making any attempts to get her poetry published and was also, going by what Emily wrote in letters, very frightening, often having dark moods. She even wrote that she was afraid of making mistakes around him. I just don't want to lose you. Promise me, Emily. Promise... Promise you what? Just promise me you won't get married and move away. At the same time, he did want his daughters as well as his son to receive a good education and really did build her a conservatory to grow flowers in. I win! Old maid! You're the old maid! I suppose I am. Poor dad, just an old spinster. Oh, lonely me, lonely me. <laughs> Number two, Henry David Thoreau. Wrong. Where are you going? To Walden. All the way to Concord? Why? To find Thoreau. I think he can help me. Not content with changing common ideas about one famous American writer, Dickinson also took a stab at Henry David Thoreau, influential transcendentalist, now played by legendary comedian John Mulaney. A man only needs one set of clothes, you know, despite the endless dictates of fashion. In the show, Emily goes to get his help to save a tree the new railroad threatens to destroy and finds him to be a selfish hypocrite whose mother does his laundry. The idea that Thoreau was a hypocrite is relatively new among his critics, and very few people believe it. He remains popular. They're going to cut down my favorite tree. Is this part of the interview? But Emily Dickinson never actually met Thoreau, making the episode lose even more water. We still loved watching it, though. Well, thank you, but I already know that. That woman was wrong about you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Cup. She said that you were a phony, but she's the phony. I know that, but you know women. <laughs> Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, her sexuality, right. Shouldn't you be downstairs helping mother? Yep, that's why we got a maid. Dickinson has finally vindicated scholars around the world who have been arguing that Emily and her best friend Susan Huntington Gilbert were in love for decades. 
While it's still tricky to apply modern labels to people who lived a long time ago, there is a very strong case to be made for Emily and Sue, mostly made up of the letters they exchanged and poetry Emily wrote about her sister-in-law. Ha! Huh? What the hell are you doing? Susan really was the love of Emily's life and her closest confidant, and being Sister Lavinia's first choice of who should edit Emily's poems for posthumous publication. You really loved him. Yeah. Almost as much as I love you. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.